All right. Uh, uh, thank you, everybody, for uh, joining in um, today. Uh, we're going to do a 90-minute session on the City of Ottawa's uh, new official plan. Uh, it's due out sometime in 2021. Uh, I was originally told uh, we, we had a deadline of December uh, 2021, but the City of Ottawa was ambitious, uh, which I think is a good thing. And they're, they're moving up the delivery date, I think, to January 2021. And I'm going to share my screen with you guys so you can see my, uh, my slide deck. And uh, Eva, can you see it okay? I can. Mm -hmm. All right. So um, I got involved uh, with uh, 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 Steve Willis, who heads up the economic and uh, sorry, the planning and economic development department of the uh, city of Ottawa many years ago now. And uh, Steve uh, was with a private company, and then he moved to the NCC, and then finally to the city of Ottawa. And I wrote an OBJ column on Steve Willis, uh, and I called him the most important man in, in, in Ottawa, or most important person, excuse me, uh, over the next 10 years, because uh, planning and economic development, the department at the city, I think does have tremendous amount of influence over what this city is going to look like in the next uh, decade or two. And then uh, uh, Steve Willis and John Smith and Charmaine For Forgy and Alan McAllis and their team there decided that they wanted to try and produce a, a new official plan that, that was nothing like what we had seen before. So what we're trying to do today, we've got about 90 minutes to have some input from all you folks, so you're not going to hear a lot from me, is um, the city would like to try and create an official plan for the 21st century whatever that is, but something that's more adaptive and more uh, reflective, I think, of the wishes of the people who live here, the people who will eventually live here, and all sectors. So not just, you know, what do BIAs want, what do chambers of commerce want, what do developers want, uh, what do realtors want, you know, but also what do tenants want, what do social agencies want, and so that's what I'm trying to get today. So. There you go. So I think most of you know me. My name is Bruce Firestone. Um, uh, I am best known as the founder of the Ottawa Senators, but that's not all I do. I am a real estate broker and real estate investment and business coach. But today I'm your host and, and moderator. Uh, let me see if I can change the slide. So what are we doing today for the ne next, uh, uh, you know, 86 minutes? Um, this is a recorded town hall session. It will be uploaded to YouTube so other people can watch it if they want to. So it's publicly available. And of course, there are no dumb questions and there are no dumb answers today. So, you know, like, like most Canadians, maybe all Canadians, we're going to show each other R-E-S-P-E-C-T. We're going to show each other respect. And what we're trying to do is we're, this is kind of a form of delegated democracy. Essentially, what we're trying to do is come up with some new ideas, uh, come up with a, a consensus, if possible, and some buy-in from the community as to what we want from our city. So it's an opportunity today to make your voices uh, heard. And um, you know, if your dog is barking, uh, you know, on Zoom here, you you can't. There is a way to mute yourself and unmute yourself. So you know, feel free to mute yourself if your dog is barking, so that we can actually uh, keep going. Um, and even though this session is quite short, if there's interest, I can always do another one or two or even three sessions to, to get more uh, input. So that's kind of what we're doing today. And at any time, if you have a question, there is a chat box. So if you go into your chat box, you know, uh, which is if you look in your Zoom controls, you can always message me and I'll see it and then I'll stop and I'll read it and, and I'll come to you if you want. So what is delegated democracy? Maybe the, the, the best example of what we're trying to do today is uh, uh, what, what happened in Ireland, which uh, asked uh, a former uh, Supreme Court justice, a retired Supreme Court justice, uh, her name was Mary Lafoy, to head up something called delegated democracy on a very controversial issue, which was abortion rights in Ireland. I think uh, Ireland had totally banned abortion. And what um, the justice did was she brought in groups uh, from, uh, from the church, uh, from, from women's rights groups, and, and many others. And within two years, they had a consensus as to what could happen. It went, uh, it, it went through parliament, and then it went to a national referendum, and they got almost two-thirds of the people in Ireland to approve something that was very controversial. And that was an excellent result. So the city of Ottawa was trying to do something uh, similar here. Uh, for those of you who know me, 
Um, I am a kind of a follower, I guess you'd say, of noted urbanist Jane Jacobs, originally a New York native who, who moved to Canada many years ago and lived, I think, mostly in Toronto. And she had a concept called subsidiarity. And what she said was that the closer government is to the people, probably the more important it is. So, and I believe that. I think your city, whether you live in Ottawa or you live in Carleton Place or you live in Tallahassee, you know, or Nashville or Austin, I, I think, you know, what your city, the policies that your city um, uh, puts in place are, are really important. You may be more important than your state government or your provincial government or even your federal uh, government. So, so I, I kind of believe that and that's what we're doing today. So I really encourage people to speak up. And I've got about 20 or 21 questions I'm going to throw out there. And I want, this is not for me to talk for the ni next 90 minutes. So please feel free to put your, your um, uh, views forward. And, and the first question is very open-ended. What should the city of Ottawa's new official plan do to impact, change, improve the local economy? And what do you want from the, the city in a new official plan? So if you would like to comment on that, uh, please feel free to do so. Okay, Bruce, can you hear my voice? Uh, who is this? Hi, it's Bob, walking and calling. Oh, hi, Bob. Uh, can you turn your volume up a little bit? Or just get closer to the mic and speak louder. But yes, we can hear you. Okay, there. Is that a little better now? It is better. Go ahead, Bob. Okay. Well, I think one of the big things that hits me when you hear about the local economy is I think we're seeing a lot of trend towards a shared economy and in the shared economy you're seeing things like uber you're seeing things like ride sharing you're seeing other other examples of you know like uh, uh, the housing area where you're getting a home putting into a second dwelling in the basement or making uh, single homes into duplexes and triplexes. And I believe that the official plan should recognize the shared economy. The, the city plan should try and make it easier for new entrepreneurs to improve the economy in the city of Ottawa. And I think there should be a, a continuation of some of the policies that we've seen, uh, conversions of homes into uh, duplexes and triplexes as well as coaching homes in the in the back backyard uh, where there can be uh, improved density into uh, the home and provide more entrepreneurship for individual citizens in in the city well uh, thank you very much Bob and I, I think that was very useful um, I, I think the city right now is is examining the question, for example, of uh, uh, Airbnb or vacation vacation rental by owner, VRBO, and other home sharing platforms. And uh, a, a number of cities feel that um, uh, that 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 maybe they should ban Airbnb or VRBO. Uh, others uh, feel that they should limit it or curtail it. Uh, mainly because they think uh, or they believe that um, uh, it cuts down on uh, the supply of housing. But, you know, what you mentioned, Bob, is the other side of the coin, which is that, that you know, if you're allowed to create side yard apartments or basement apartments or even coach houses in your backyard, that, that kind of increases the supply. Does anybody else want to chime in on that? Yeah, so Bruce... Oh, sorry. Can, can you just, as people chime in, that's fine, uh, Christian, can you just identify yourself and, and then please go ahead. Sure, sure. So Christian Spielfogel. Um, so there, there's a couple comments. So just going on that same theme, right? There, there's other aspects I'd probably want to add, but let's stick to the theme. Um, one is that, uh, you know, there's this false belief that the, you know, things like Airbnb are actually creating a housing, housing issue. And you take a look at even what Fairbnb is projecting as as many as a thousand units being used for for uh, you know short term rentals. The reality is that the housing stock is well over a hundred thousand of rentals. So we're talking about a less than one percent impact. And and in reality, I think that's eventually going to saturate just the law of supply and demand. So the uh, uh, you know so I think there's a bit of a red herring there. So I think going back to the base principle that uh, the gentleman was just saying earlier is that it's a new business model. 
right? New business models should be encouraged. We shouldn't be putting regulation in place to preserve old business models. Regulation is there to protect uh, the consumer. Regulation is there to protect the citizens. Uh, it's not to preserve one business model over another. So I think as we, uh, you know, as he quite rightly put it, uh, the shared economy is a, a new form of business model that's, you know, manifesting in a number of ways. We need to take a look at, uh, at the appropriate regulations with the new business models. That's an excellent point. All right. Uh, that, that was very useful, guys. Good job. Um, uh, I've got a number of things that I'm going to show you in a minute. And it's just a, a question for, for the, the group. Which of the following would you want or not want to see included or permitted in residential areas in the new official plan? And it's just a, a list, which I'll show you in a minute. But, but before I show you that list, I did want to show you just pictures of the Glebe, which most people on the call will know. This is the downtown, uh, part of downtown Ottawa. When you look at the Glebe, you know, it has... Um, obviously beautiful housing, but it has stores and shops, it has infill development, it has uh, condos and offices, <laughs> it even has a, a stadium and, and an arena uh, in the heart of it. And, and I think one could argue that the Glebe is, is, a, is a desirable place uh, to, to live. So one of the questions I wanted to throw at you guys today is that the city of Ottawa is looking at what should or should not be included, and they want guidance from uh, from from you know, citizens. So you have things like uh, attic apartments, above the garage apartments. We talked about basement or side yard apartments, coach houses, uh, service shops, arenas, stadiums, event centers, uh, high rise condos, restaurants, pubs, uh, shops, housing co ops, nonprofit housing, group homes, halfway houses, having offices in residential areas for doctors, lawyers, dentists. Uh, co-working space, should we allow workshops, uh, yes or no? Uh, should we allow, we do allow now, should we continue to allow home offices, micro retail? There's some people I know in some neighborhoods who have uh, little tiny stores that, that stock pool supplies for their neighbors. Uh, should we allow student housing, infill housing? You know, uh, wall murals. You know, there's there's a lot of uh, uh, you know uh, conflict that can arise over over murals. So I I throw it out to you guys. What 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 are your views? What are some of the uses that that you would like to see encouraged, and maybe some that you wouldn't? Bruce, this is Paul Devi. Hi, Paul. Um, I personally would like to see just about everything in that you mentioned in a typical uh, larger neighborhood uh, when. After the Second World War, and even after the First World War, cities in North America tried to separate the toxic uh, factories from the residential right. areas. But that's not the way we live. We tend to live, uh, uh, it's, we don't have these, these areas as, as uh, silos. You know, if you look at, your, if I may make an analogy of a modern home, no longer do you have the Victorian sitting room and living room and kitchen. It is more of an open area that probably uses less real estate is more fle and is more flexible for the family. You know, you could, in some of these neighborhoods, older neighborhoods that are more diverse, you could, you could start off uh, as a student housing, you get married, you have your kids, you move into a house, and then later on, maybe as you're re retiring, getting older, you can transition to a high-rise condo. You might even be able to have uh, somebody in the house might have their own small business. You might have an office down the street. Somebody else may have a retail. Yeah. People talk about trying to ha reduce our impact on the environment. Well, I think having these hard segregations of uh, activities in our cities forces us to, to, to drive. And you can't put it all in transit when... Right. Right. When you have these hard uh, divisions between, so what, would it be fair to say that you're you're, you're talking about a walkable mixed-use neighborhood? Yes. All right. Now, I, I believe Paul, you live in Canada. Correct. And I know you have some views on Canada North because Canada North is is siloed. You know, you have the Canada North uh, Business Park, which uh, has many major major office buildings, um, and then you have you know, uh, I guess. Uh, Briarbrook and you have uh, Canada Lakes um, and, and pretty much every 
trip is a car trip, I think, in Canada North. Um, uh, what kind of changes would you uh, want to bring to Canada North, uh, Paul? My So I live in Canada South in Bridalwood. Okay. I don't at the moment work in Canada North. Um, I don't have any commercial interests in Canada North. But as a resident of Canada, I've seen the problems of Canada North, particularly the, the uh, technology part. Right. Uh, you have, everything needs to be, you need to drive everywhere. Even from one office building to another that are beside right. each other, they are such a distance. It is very difficult to walk. The sidewalks are crumbling. There are not many of them. It is the worst environment in the city next to another industrial park uh, on Mayerville. So, and yet, this is what where we have. Right. Well, what are your recommendations, Paul? I personally, I would like to see probably looser, looser uh, zoning requirements, allowing uh, a, a more built-out mixture of office, uh, including industrial, uh, residential, retail, maybe retail on the ground floor, buildings built out to the sidewalk. Right. Uh, increased density uh, because when you look at downtown Toronto one of the things that's so exciting about downtown Toronto is there are a lot more people living and working there right. so there's activity and energy on the street there's places as you're walking it you feel very safe because there are stores uh, and that attracts your attention Canada North has none of that as okay. well, that needs if if you look at excuse me, I'm going to close my window. If you look at Canada North, the age of the buildings, many of them are in the 40-year range. They're going to need to be probably as most commercial buildings are after 40 years torn down. We're at the cusp of a huge transition, yet we don't have a vision for it. I would also like to see personally. Uh, LRT going out to Canada North, a spur that would service uh, Canada North. And that's an excellent, excellent uh, addition to this uh, town meetup. Thank you, Paul. Okay, right. qu question three. The city of Ottawa has six main engines of growth today. Uh, government, which wouldn't surprise anybody on this call. Uh, technology, uh, certainly Shopify leading the way uh, these days. Uh, education, uh, both uh, you know, primary, uh, secondary, and tertiary. Healthcare, uh, tourism, and entertainment, and festivals. Uh, that I include museums in that, just in case you're wondering. Um, real estate. Are there any others that you think should be a priority for the city? You know, if you think about Toronto for a minute, Toronto, in addition to these six, um, has, a, for example, a very big financial industry and uh, a significant uh, car manufacturing uh, um, uh, industry as well. So I, I think Toronto probably has, you know, two or three, maybe for all I know, four or five more uh, economic engines, and they're doing very well. But these are the big six, uh, I think, in Ottawa. Does anybody have a, a, a seventh that you think the city of Ottawa should focus on? Hi, it's Rebecca Ayers. Hi, Rebecca. Hello. Um, I, I want to make a pitch here for something that is a little bit lateral. Um, we are a city of 2,400 square kilometers, uh, <laughs> and we currently have an enormous um, amount of tension and hostility and differences in views about the potential of this city between rural, suburban, and urban parts of the city. And I think it would be really wonderful if we could actually unite around the idea of um, an, uh, an economy that really leverages the um, natural resources and the natural environments that are within the boundaries of the official city. So um, I would you know, put a strong plug in there for um, more of a focus on the local agricultural economy. We do a lot of exports on our agricultural lands right now. Um, and also to even consider our forestry resources. I know that's a little bit of a sacred cow and I'm an environmentalist, so I'm totally into natural areas protection. 
but I think that we could potentially generate quite a bit of biomass as fuel substitution for our energy systems. And we could uh, potentially also, in the longer term, um, produce uh, materials for construction. So I think we need. I think we need. I think we need to start looking at this city in terms of its in terms of its entire assets and not just, you know, in terms of the built environment. Re Rebecca, have you seen a, a map of Ottawa? Uh, you know, which goes from Armprior to uh, Kempville to Rockland, and superimposed on it, I think, are the cities of Vancouver, Calgary, Edmonton, yeah, exactly, yeah, and Montreal, yeah. and they all fit within yeah. the boundaries of the city of Ottawa, and they leave a little yeah. bit. Of extra room. So have a look at the next slide, Rebecca, on my uh, on my slide deck here. So you and I, are, I think, are on the same wavelength. Uh, and I, this is a question for you. Um, uh, you know, I, I know Bill and Ann Saunders, who started uh, Saunders Farm, which was originally a, a grow your own or sort of pick your own uh, strawberry place. And they added something called agritainment uses, if you know what those are, right. to, to yeah. strengthen their economic foundation. Because you know, pick your own strawberries was doing well for a while and then maybe not so well. So they added things like, you know, those uh, Halloween uh, scary rides and uh, of course they do weddings and receptions. So how, how do you yeah. think in addition to the grow local, um, maybe some uh, development of the forestry resources, how do you feel about adding agritainment? Well, I mean, sure, you know, whatever, uh, you know, tourism is obviously one of the, uh, one of the, uh, six that you identified, and you know we we focus a lot on bringing in tourists from the outside, but there is also economic spin-off benefits from keeping people locally and from you know having activities that uh, that support staycations and support people spending their money locally. It's it's really all about that multiplier effect in terms of um, how dollars are spent. And right now we are spending though a lot of dollars. 95% of the energy that is consumed in the city of Ottawa is actually imported from beyond the boundaries of the city. If we could substitute even 5% of that through biomass, for example, or through solar, um, we uh, are, are actually keeping hundreds of millions of dollars within the city that are otherwise immediately going out of the city. That, that, so is, a, that is a fantastic... Uh, uh, additional point. I really am grateful for you bringing it up. Uh, I had never thought of that, that we actually run a, a, an energy deficit here, but I think that's what you're getting at, Rebecca. So, mm -hmm. uh, um, Bruce? Yes. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, can you just identify yourself? Sure. It's Andrea Steenbakers. Oh, uh, hi, Andrea. Hi, I'm in the Barhaven uh, end of the city. Um, I just wanted to um, say I totally agree with Rebecca, I think it was the previous speaker. Right. Uh, with regard to the, f we really have not focused at all on our agricultural assets uh, in Ottawa proper and even in the surrounding uh, rural areas. Um, so I, 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 I like your uh, agritainment idea, but I also see, um, as Rebecca was starting to talk about, um, also a marriage with agriculture and technology. Um, and uh, with the launch of the Avon. Um, area in the NCC lands, um, you know, at on Hunt Club, um, there are tons of opportunities for um, bringing, bringing agriculture together with, you know, some of the, t some of the smaller uh, tech startups that are working in the Canada area right now um, to develop new, um, new businesses that would, would sort of bring those two um, sectors together. Um, I also just wanted to comment on Paul's, um, his uh, points about the Canada North Business Park. I would also like to see a zoning review um, in the CityGate Business Park on the 416 at Barhaven. Um, I agree that, that we need to start looking things a little bit differently and, and, and definitely encouraging more mixed use types of developments in these business parks and more walkable and that sort of thing. Um, you know, I think, you know, I think it would be if the city could look at the possibility of um, even incentivizing, you know, businesses that aren't located in Ottawa or even in Canada um, to locate in our various business parks around the city. Um, I don't know if that's something that would fall under the scope of an official plan, but I think that would be 
extremely helpful. Um, I think we need more people living in traditional business areas and we need more businesses in traditional residential areas like suburbs so that um, we can have more complete communities that are, are walkable and, uh, and you know, that, that take cars off the roads, that sort of thing. I, I think those are very strong points, and Andrea, thank you very much uh, for that. And, and as I said when we started this uh, town hall, and again, thank you all so much. For, I mean, you know, everybody's so busy, even uh, having 18 or 20 people uh, uh, spend an hour and a half of their time. I'm very grateful. And and your voices are going to be heard. That That is, is my job. I've been hired by the city of Ottawa um, as a kind of a delegate uh, you know, to, to bring people together. And as I said, when I started, if, if we don't get through all the questions today, I, you know, I, I'll do another town hall and I'll do as many until, as, as long as people want to, want to come and make their views heard. I will make sure that these views are heard and uh, I think they're important. And whether or not I particularly agree with something uh, or not is not relevant here. What is relevant here are your views, uh, not mine. Uh, so the slides that you see today for me are, are, are supposed to get people thinking and talking. They're, they're, that's not policy, that's just ideas that uh, I thought might be helpful to get people uh, your mind around the questions. Okay, question number four. Um, okay, well, we, I, we might have covered this already uh, um, uh, with uh, two responses, but being able to produce food locally is a concern in many jurisdictions. What should the city of Ottawa uh, do in this area, if anything? And I, I think we, we have also, we, I think we've covered this, unless somebody else has something that they want to throw in here, I think I can just move to push the number. Uh, Bruce? Yes, yes. Bruce, so I, I, it's, Paul D more. Yeah, it's Paul Devey. Um, yes. The Niagara Peninsula has, uh, in the last 10 years, really reoriented a lot of its uh, growing areas. Yep. It's now diversifying away from just grapes. For many years, it was uh, peaches and apples. Right. Now what they're doing is a lot of the farms are moving to uh, more market, short-term market uh, farming. Okay. Uh, some two Saunders, but they're supplying fresh uh, food to the uh, higher-end restaurants in Toronto. Right. There is a very tight connection between the restaurants in Toronto now. Wow, I like that, Paul and the, the producers, and they're bypassing the traditional distribution chains. That, that's such a great idea, and I'm glad you stopped me from moving on because, um, you know, I, I, I work with a lot of farmers, and, uh, and, and if they sell, you know, if they sell their fruits and vegetables uh, to a large multinational chain, they get this much money. If they sell it to a restaurant directly, they get multiples of that, so it would make the the farmer much more economically viable, make the food fresher, uh, probably better for, for us as human beings to eat there. So I, I think that's great. Uh, I did want to show everybody a picture. I did some work last year in, in Portugal. And one of the things I found in Portugal is that backyard homesteading is a thing. It's a big thing. And not just in Portugal, but I took these pictures. So this is a little a village uh, called Pinhao, and you can see they're producing energy locally. Do you see that, guys, in the, in the background there? There's wind turbines everywhere in this area, and virtually every house had a, a backyard homestead, and um, it, it, if you're interested in this concept, and I think some of you probably are, there's a book called The Backyard Homestead, and on 10,000 square feet, which is roughly a quarter of an acre, you can harvest 1,400 eggs, 50 pounds of wheat, 60 pounds of fruit, 2,000 pounds of vegetables, 280 pounds of pork, and 75 pounds of, of nuts. Um, so, so the idea of, of growing local and then also creating uh, relationships between people who are growing local, whether it's very small like this or, or quite large, uh, and, uh, you know, uh, direct sales to consumers or direct sales to, to restaurants. I think, Paul, that's a very strong idea. A yeah. couple of quick things. It's, it's Rebecca Ayers speaking again. Um, I just wanted to note that one of the other things that's really important for a strong agricultural economy is some kind of distribution infrastructure. We actually do not have a, um, a food distribution center in Ottawa, but um, North House Foods, Just Food, and Savor Ottawa have just collaborated, I think, with support from the city to um, establish a distribution center for local foods. 
um, that it, that would be going to wholesalers, so wholesalers can actually order um, through this system. It's going up online very soon, and and be assured that what they're getting are locally produced foods because they're they're verified as locally grown. Um, so, uh, but the other but the other issue, you know, especially in the face of of uh, climate disruption, disruptions and, and extreme weather events is our um, our food security and we really don't have uh, anything in the way of local storage capacity either. So I think we, re we really need to take a look at uh, a whole range of infrastructure that can both help to support the local economy and ensure food security in the event of disruptions um, in the larger food systems that supply us. I'm not by any means suggesting you know, total self-sufficiency, but I think that there are steps that we can take that will both benefit the economy and provide some security. Yeah, I, 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 I'm buying that. And I've got a lot of friends who have interest in that too. Okay, question number five. Bruce, Bruce, this oh, okay. is Paul Devey again. Okay. Um, as, uh, as the previous uh, caller was uh, talking about that, what came to my mind was, uh, you know, there may be, there might be an opportunity to put the the, the uh, consumers, the restaurants, and the producers together locally by a an application that would allow uh, people to order, uh, you know, and then it could be delivered by Uber Eats, etc. I know chefs like to go see it, but uh, th that may be an, a business opportunity for somebody, a new business model. I I think uh, the idea of combining tech and agriculture, that's exactly what we've been talking about for the last uh, few minutes. All right, I'm going to move on to question five. I'm going to try and get through as many of these as I can before our time is up. And as a moderator, as your host, I, I totally respect your time. We will be finished at 1.30. <laughs> We're done. Uh, so I'll get, I'll get everybody uh, back to work so you don't get fired and, and I don't get fired. Um, so, government interest in, in funding affordable housing uh, is um, it, its its construction, its maintenance, and operation is notable. I mean, there's a lot of interest um, in, in, at the federal level, the provincial level, and certainly at the city level. Um, is, can somebody uh, uh, mute themselves, please? There's a bit of background noise. Hang on, I'll see who it is. Uh, all right, thank you. Just uh, if, if somebody comes in or your dog is barking, um, you know, I, I completely understand that. Um, uh, just just mute yourself and, uh, you know, if my wife comes in and asks me a question, <laughs> I guess I'll have to mute myself too. Um, anyway, uh, question five, there's a lot of interest in, in affordable housing, um, but are there any ideas out there that any of you guys have that you'd like to contribute is there something that we can do as a city, we can do as individuals, whether we're realtors or investors or developers or social agencies? Uh, is there anything that we can do independent of government to encourage more affordable housing in Ottawa? Boy, this is, this is a tough, sorry, it's Christian Skillful. This is a tough one, Bruce, because uh, as you know, I'm very opinionated on this particular topic. Um, and uh, I've uh, mentioned to you before, based on uh, last time I looked at CMHC data, uh, you know, effectively more than 50% of uh, rental housing is provided by pretty small operators, mom and pop operators. And one of the biggest issues, and it's not really in the city's control, it's more in the province's control, um, is encouraging and ensuring that there's a bit of a de-risk for mom and pops to be able to get into the housing business and to start to open up uh, various venues, whether it's secondary dwelling units, whether it's uh, adding, you know, duplexes, triplexes, whatever it happens to be. Uh, but right now, there there is a significant fear in a lot of mom and pops that uh, you know they're going to get bad tenants. They're going to have real issues trying to uh, you know hold on to their uh, their property if things go wrong. So, and it's not really a funding issue per se, it's more of a, a regulation issue, it's things associated with the landlord, tenant board, et cetera. So there's an aspect here where we do need to speak up, I guess, as citizens to make sure that at a provincial level, we start to modify the, the behavior of trying to protect everyone and getting nowhere with anyone, right? So, uh, you know, that's kind of my two cents on that one. 
Well, uh, uh, thank you very much, Christian. Anyone else would like to chime in, please do. Rebecca Aird again. Christian, that, that's a really interesting point. I'd love to see that stat about 50% of rental housing being, being provided by small property owners. That, that's really interesting. Um, I think we should uh, take a look at the city's uh, housing paper that they produced as a sort of a kickoff for um, official plan discussions. There's a lot of good stuff in there. You know, fundamentally, when we talk about affordable housing, our mind goes to subsidized affordable housing. But in fact, we are going down the same road that just about every other major and growing city in North America is going down in terms of the affordable middle. Um, people, even you know, even uh, families on one income, that's a decent income, sixty or seventy thousand dollars. If they've got a couple of kids, are not going to find housing in the downtown that's affordable to them. So it's partly, uh, uh, it's partly the law of supply and demand. We obviously need more rental housing in particular because the vacancy rates are so low. Yeah. And I think, I think this city has to get friendlier with intensification. And and we as citizens have a responsibility to uh, understand and to advocate for intensification. You know, it needs to be done sensitively, but even, even the missing middle that people talk about, which is three to six story buildings, we don't have much of that really in our major residential areas and a lot could be done to use existing infrastructure, to avoid sprawl, to create more affordable housing through um, you know, smaller units with just the missing middle. And I think that's gonna be a push in the upcoming official plan and I think we should all get behind it. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, yeah, I completely agree with Rebecca and the intensification piece. And we do need to, like I just focused on one aspect, right? But there are aspects as well that the city has control of that. Yeah. Uh, slow down the ability to build. Right. Bruce? Yes. Uh, it's Paul. Uh, several, about a year ago, Randall Denley did an article where he analyzed the cost of a $400,000 home in Ottawa. Approximately 20% of it is uh, attributable to federal, provincial, and municipal taxes. Yeah, uh, that doesn't surprise me. One thing I did want to show the group today is uh, this is a a housing co-op in Canada. Paul, I'm sure you would know it. It's called Blue, Blue Heron Co-op. It's on March Road, very close to uh, Terry Matthews Canada North uh, Research Park. And um, this is, uh, I, I can't remember exactly how many units, but um, there's about, I, I'm guessing, 40 uh, 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 two-bedroom apartments in this uh, four-story uh, apartment building you see here, and then there's about, I think, another 40 townhouses in behind. And a couple of things that we did, uh, Pam Cripps, uh, who was a Kinetic counselor at the time, and myself, uh, and a number of other people, we, uh, we did this uh, project. It was the first co-op, housing co-op built in 15 years in the province of Ontario. After all, funding was removed uh, by Mike Harris when he was premier uh, for social housing. And we produced this, and we did a number of things to make it more affordable. Number one, it's on land that's leased from St. John's Anglican Church, so there was no upfront payment for the land. But then Pam Cripps and, and myself and others did some other things that, that actually helped produce affordable housing. I just wanted to throw this out there at everybody. One of the things that um, is done in this co-op is some of the units are at or close to fair market value. And the extra money that the co-op gets from those are actually recycled internally to people who need uh, rent geared to income housing. So, so rather than having our hand out every, every year or every six months uh, to, to the city or to the province or even the feds, um, there's an internal subsidy here. Uh, how do people feel about sort of a little bit of independence uh, generated this way? Yeah, I think, I think the mixed market model makes a lot of sense and we have um, some affordable housing providers like Ottawa Community Housing that actually do that as part of their model, um, as well as um, OCH even, the Ottawa Community Housing is, is moving towards that with their new Gladstone development. So it makes enormous sense to be able to cross subsidize like that and congratulations, that's a great um, use of um, of church land. It's a, it's a really interesting model. I wasn't aware of it, so I, yeah, I will pass and, that on. And Rebecca, just so you know, uh, St. John's uh, was going to sell this four and a half acre site for a one time payment, and uh, uh, and I talked to uh, uh, David Clooney, who was the 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 minister there, and I said, David. 
rather than do that, why don't you land lease it? And, you know, um, and then I did something wrong, Rebecca. I said, you know, the Holy Roman Catholic Church has been doing that for a thousand years. They've been doing land leases. And when you talk to Anglicans and you talk about the, the Catholic Church, that probably was the wrong thing for me to say. But uh, eventually, <laughs> yeah, eventually the, the church recognized that. So they have, uh, St. John's has a steady regular income. And, you know, these uh, units, just so you know, even the ones that are rented, uh, Rebecca, in Canada to the general marketplace you are about 850 to $900 a month for a two-bedroom. Uh, just a, a, a yeah. not, not very far away from uh, a major developer, you can rent a two bedroom for sixteen or seventeen hundred dollars a month. So, so e even though they're at you know the market units are, are at nine hundred dollars, they're still well under probably seven hundred dollars a month under under the market. So, so the, the the subsidy system internal does give us some independence, and of course the land leasing d did reduce the, the the cost quite considerably. So, thanks for that support. Uh, question uh, six. Yeah. Question six. Um, house prices in residential rents are are soaring, um, and and we know this. It's not just Ottawa. It's Toronto. It's Vancouver. It's uh, it, it, it's Boston. It's San Francisco. It's Austin. Uh, you know, it's just it's you know. I, I think I read somewhere within five years, the only people who'll be able to live in San Francisco will have to have incomes of three hundred thousand U.S. dollars a year or higher. Anyone less than that, will, which you won't even be able to afford uh, an apartment. A two-bedroom apartment in, in the Mission District in San Francisco, I have a few clients there, is between seven and $8,000 a month uh, U.S. dollars, so almost $10,000 Canadian dollars to, to rent. That, that's really a lot of money. Um, so house prices uh, are, are, are really increasing in Ottawa, and so are rents. Um, and this is very controversial. This, uh, you know, the group here may, 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 you know, uh, not agree with this. But one of the, the things that, as an economist, one would say is that when something's in short supply, one of the ways to control uh, its price is to increase supply. So the question is, uh, the city of Ottawa has been very, very, very strong in terms of limiting the amount of land that's available for development. And as a result, the city has gotten taller, no question about that, but also prices for houses, as Paul pointed out and others have pointed out, and rents have increased. So should the uh, city of Ottawa give regard to making more development land available, yes or no? Did I lose you guys? I guess I'll do Who is it? Bruce? Okay. No. Uh, we have to identify yourself if you don't mind. Hi, Sorry, it's Eva. Oh, who's going to go first, Bruce? Well, uh, uh, Eva, is that you? Yes, it's Eva. So just, just identify yourself, Hi. and then please go ahead, and and uh, and then anybody else, just chime in, guys. Hi, this is Eva. Um, just pros and cons for both staying within the boundaries or going beyond. Going beyond, you can develop these um, walkable neighborhoods and and you know work from home or nearby um but it and that's that's a plus but then you you have to build the infrastructure if you if you expand within you already have the infrastructure but you're going to have crazy congestion i mean the traffic now downtown at rush hour is insane um if you if you do expand within the boundaries, um, I believe it's going to have to be a lot of mixed use. So okay. I'll add a comment in here. Uh, so I'm much more of a proponent towards intensification. And, and part of the reason is that, uh, you know, basic mathematics will show you that as a city expands, the costs actually go up by, by uh, effectively non-linearly. So it's like an R squared law, if you will. So take a circle, you expand it, the overall area and the cost of infrastructure to service it goes up, uh, you know, it becomes quite expensive. So there may be a balance that we can do here where there is a provision for additional land for development, but the way that we're collecting revenue as a city at the moment is we're punishing the intensification side of things, the people who live effectively 
within the urban core and giving the, uh, the suburban side a bit of a break. Not in the development fees, mind you. So the development fees, we do have a um, you know some balance there. But once you get to the property tax side of things, so the ongoing operational cost for the city, um, in that case, it favors uh, further out. So you know what I would you know propose to see is that we start to invert that. Uh, where we not you would grandfather what exists today, but as you start to expand the city, we actually look at a say a higher mill rate associated with the property tax for to deal with the fact that we have a, an ongoing burden in terms of managing uh, you know infrastructure cost um, and therefore encouraging more intensification and with intensification of course uh, you know combined with mixed use you get much more efficiency there's less uh, travel required so the infrastructure costs for transportation become more efficient uh, let alone the standard city services such as uh, electricity and uh, water and sewer uh, that's, that's, very, very, that's very that's very good put. yep mm -hmm. sorry rebecca go um, ahead well I, I, anyway i just I, I i really support that and i just think you know in terms of in terms of a sustainable future overall human populations have to concentrate themselves and allow natural systems and ecological functions to take place on a greater area of land around the planet. And if that happens, a lot of the challenges that we're seeing from climate change to flooding to, you know, uh, an and inability to, to have arable land, a lot of those issues would, would actually be dealt with. So I think, you know, it's, it's just something that has both immediate benefits in terms of all the servicing that the previous speaker spoke about, but also, um, you know, in the longer term, it's just a, a more sustainable option for, for our future on the planet. I think Rebecca, that is correct. Uh, I have a pet theory of mine. I have no proof. I just it's just a theory that uh, probably two thirds of the ocean and uh, probably a similar proportion of the, the the surface area of the Earth should have no humans in it. And I mean, even including even including even yeah. including ecotourism. Uh, if you want to know where the, the the greatest biodiversity happens to exist, it's two areas. One is the DMZ, the demilitarized zone between the two Koreas, where there are no human beings, trust me. Yeah. And two, yeah. the area around Chernobyl, where there are not supposed to be any. Yeah, yeah, very yeah. interesting. And, no, and, no, it's, it's very and, true. And, and, and so it's, uh, I, I it'll, think just, it'll just make the planet healthier and more interesting if we, if we reduce our footprint. Yeah, Yeah, I mean, and, and literally, human beings just don't go there. And, and, and there you go. Uh, so thank you very much for the, the, that input. It was excellent. Bruce, Bruce, the the elephant in the room here. We uh, after I, and Paul, just because other people are going to watch this, if you don't mind, everybody, please, everybody, when they come on, uh, I guess maybe not me because you'll you'll see a lot of me. But can you just say, hey, it's Paul Devi again? Okay, it's Paul Devi again. Uh, the elephant in the room, though, we were talking about uh, increased uh, density. We're talking about more mixed use. It's not going to work with the current uh, uh, zoning and planning process in the city hall and how they do the resourcing. It takes five years at least to get the smallest change. Uh, we're, not, we're never going to achieve anything in any plan unless the city figures out how it's going to do the, the zoning and the planning and changes. I think you're going to hear, Paul, that uh, Steve Willis uh, and his 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 group, they are very, uh, I believe this, they are very open uh, to hearing exactly that and finding ways to, to, to maybe uh, change that. Um, when I started uh, it, it, in, uh, it, it, when I came moved to Ottawa in 1983, you could get a, a zoning change done in, in, in 10 months or less. And, and today, you know, it, it takes a lot longer. So I, I thank you for that. Uh, questions that we're kind of changing directions now. Uh, 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 the city of Ottawa and its agencies, we have a lot of development agencies in Ottawa, Invest Ottawa being one of them, and of course, uh, economic uh, planning and economic development in the city of Ottawa, and there's others, chambers of commerce, what have you. Question for this group, uh, should they focus on attracting more multinationals to locate their offices, labs, uh, subsidiaries here, or for, focus more on assisting homegrown entrepreneurs? What, what, what's, where, where should their priorities be? So I guess, Bruce, it's Christian Spilfo. I, I obviously have an opinion on this. Um, 
And right now there is a bit of a balance, uh, but in the big scheme of things, we do need to be focusing more on assisting homegrown entrepreneurs because that's the grassroots of creating a sustainable uh, economic base. Uh, international firms can come and go. Um, but the other thing that happens with the homegrown entrepreneurs, and this is a bit of a, a disease I think we have in Canada, is that as we build businesses, the natural tendency for small businesses as they become medium businesses is effectively to exit to international companies anyway. So even as we uh, allow them to grow, uh, they will effectively become multinationals or they will attract multinationals to come in. And if we can eventually get it to a point where you know our exit strategies are less about selling out and more about sustaining and growing a business such as you know what shopify has done for example then uh, you know that provides a far more you know roots in the ground kind of economy so christian and, just a question on that and then i'll let other people speak um uh, uh, you know if you remember cognos was started by mike potter correct um, and he sold to IBM. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, it, it does seem that that was a natural progression. How, how would the city, though, ever, you know, influence that, what se appears to be, anyway, the, the natural progression? The issue really isn't much of a city issue in terms of that natural progression of exiting. It has a lot more to do with the amount of capital av available in Canada. So, you know, eventually you get to a point where you just can't raise the kind of capital to take you to a billion dollar business without going external. Right. So and the path of least resistance is simply to be acquired by a firm that has resources, say, out of U.S., uh, you know, funds. Right. So we can't really, I don't think we can quite influence that unless we uh, influence the financial side of it. But what we can do is, even if they do sell it, so even though Cognos sold to, to IBM or Newbridge sold to Alcatel, what ends up happening is the roots are deep right, within the soil of Ottawa. So then as they get acquired, they don't naturally leave, but they can be a basis for creating new local entrepreneurships and, and businesses. So it's not unlike gardening, right? So you can transplant some things in, but if you you know plant the seeds properly and cultivate the, uh, the soil, Right, then you develop a natural ecosystem. That's a good farm analogy. Yeah, I know that somebody else wanted to chip in here. Yeah, uh, that that was me. This is Simon Case. Okay, uh, Simon, go ahead. I was just chipping in just for this point because I really do think that focusing on the homegrown entrepreneurs is the way to go, um, at least from a simplistic standpoint. Um, just because, uh, uh, you know, and I very much agree with Christian here, you are going to build a base that is going to attract multinationals if you start, if you start fostering uh, the, the homegrown talent that's here, start building those businesses, start supporting them. And I think naturally you're going to attract outside, uh, outside multinationals and companies just by focusing on your homegrown and building industries, uh, you know, that are local, that are here. Uh, makes sense. I, I like that, actually. Uh, Christian was on the same wavelength there. Yeah, this, this is Rebecca again. I, I, I think that uh, that's really well said. Um, and also, you know, getting back to the point about multiplier effects, um, locally owned businesses spend more money locally. A lot of the, um, uh, you know, profit generated by multinationals exits the city without recirculating within the local economy. So again, the multiplier effect is, is a really important thing to bear in mind. And also uh, on the sustainability theme, um, an economy that is really focused on uh, building retrofits and so on, and also on, on a bit more of a repair and reuse economy because so much of what we get is, is thrown out now. You know, if we can develop those kinds of skills locally and, and reinforce their use by residents, I think we'll be a bit ahead of the curve because I think that that uh, uh, an element of the economy that is re-emerging. That's really cool, Rebecca, because I, I coached a group uh, of Nortel engineers who when Nortel went out of business, uh, they, they set up their own very successful business uh, maintaining and uh, repairing uh, Nortel equipment around the world. It became a $100 million a year business because where are you going to go to, uh, you know, fix your, your Nortel switches? you got to find those old Nortel engineers. So <laughs> oh, that's, I hear you. Cool. that's great. Um, all right. So question number eight. Um, and we, we did kind of touch on this already. 
and I, I'm going to I'm going to skip over this unless somebody else wants to chime in here. But I am going to comment on this. I hope you don't mind. Um, I, I do think that that Christian was right earlier in this uh, town hall uh, to 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 and some other people as well to to say that to to prefer one business model over another. You know, Canada and Canada's federal government has been doing that for a long time, trying to pick winners and losers, and governments are notoriously bad at that. Uh, so banning, um, you know, uh, Airbnb, vacation rental by owner, Uber and Lyft, uh, skip the dishes, you know, that, that I think uh, it is, uh, you know, is coming close to trying to pick winners and, and, and losers and preserve maybe a taxi industry that's under, under duress. Is that really what we want our cities to do? I, I'm not sure, and I think, Christian, you probably would say no. And I just wanted to show everybody just an example of this. Um, uh, this is my wife, Dawn McMillan, and uh, she runs a, a, a little tiny, tiny, tiny Airbnb. She loves doing it. It's called The Hideaway. She converted an old garage <laughs> into, a, a, into a hideaway. Uh, it's got its own laundry facility. It's got its own... Uh, bathroom. It's got a little uh, bedroom as well. And it turns out that the major client base for this particular uh, <laughs> Airbnb unit are pregnant uh, women who want to be close to uh, the Civic Hospital uh, because they're having a high-risk pregnancy. So they tend to stay for a month or two months while they're waiting to have their, their babies. Um, and the, what I wanted to say about this is, is that, you know, we, I'm a huge advocate for affordable housing and we need more of it. But when I work with a social agency like Emily Murphy Nonprofit Housing Corporation, affordable housing is something some of their tenants, um, uh, single moms, uh, pay 80 to $90 a month in, in rent. So even if the city were to ban Airbnb so that my, my wife, for example, could run this little unit that I'm showing you here on the slides, you know, it would get rented to somebody probably for a thousand dollars a month, a little one bedroom furnished apartment. But it's not, a, it, it, it drives people in the affordable industry crazy when they say that's an affordable house. It is not. Uh, these ladies with their uh, sing, single moms, um, you know, like I said, paying less than a hundred dollars a month in rent, that's the private sector is not going to be able to, to do that. And attacking the sharing economy at least in my view. And again, this is not supposed to be about my views, it's supposed to be yours. So you can tell me if I'm wrong. No, it, you're, at, you're spot on, uh, Bruce, right? And as I said earlier in this, that uh, the impact, e even if you assume that there is an impact on affordable housing, and it's hard to believe that an impact of less than 1% would do more than a, you know, a short-term impact but eventually this balances out and this becomes nothing more than a short-term uh short-term issues but we look for years out from now everything will kind of stabilize and we'll be talking about that as yep yeah, that may have caused a little blip in the overall rental housing but it's not a long-term issue and we need to stop distracting ourselves i i think so as well and and i i do think somebody said earlier on this call that uh uh, I think Rebecca was one who said we we have the missing middle, <clears throat> and uh, we we definitely need more three to six story uh, apartment buildings, and 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 we need to increase the supply. There, there's no doubt about that in, in my mind. Ban banning, uh, you know, my wife's uh, uh, a teensy Airbnb unit will not do a, a thing for for Airbnb. Uh, sorry, for affordable housing. And, and right. I think I think there's a sorry. sorry. Go yeah, ahead. go ahead. <laughs> So, uh, it's Rebecca again. I think <laughs> you, you go, go ahead. Go ahead, Rebecca. I'll I'll speak after. No, nope, you go ahead first. Okay. So we were talking about the the sort of three to six right uh, unit piece, and it's a slight aside. Maybe you get to it later, Bruce. But that's an area where the city does have some level of influence because building anything in the say four to eight unit range. Uh, is about the worst investment sector for building right now, just because that is a completely set, there's a bunch of non-linear events that happen. Site plan control at, at four units, uh, underground cabling for power, you know, which adds another 50K at about six units. Um, going to seven units then puts you into a new residential class. So instead of a mill rate of one, you're at 1 1.4. So there's a number of step functions in there that make building in that four to eight range, 
um, absolutely ridiculous. Uh, and I've gone through it a few times and the only way you can do it is because of the way the rents have gone recently. So you're relegated now down to SDUs on the small end or building really large properties on the, on the high end. That's a really good point. Rebecca? That's really great, yeah. Well, that, thank you for that. That's really, uh, really important too. I was just gonna say on the Airbnb front though, I mean, first of all, if it's uh, a unit in your own home, um, I don't think it would come under the same, you know, kind of concerns um, that uh, owning a, a completely separate unit and renting it out exclusively as Airbnb would. And in fact, there are some uh, uh, Airbnb um, entrepreneurs who own, you know, sometimes in some cities, I don't know about Ottawa, but I suspect it might be happening here too, own, you know, dozens or even hundreds of units or rent them and 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 use them exclusively as Airbnb and I I don't think that's tenable and I think it does have a, a, a significant impact on on uh, local rental economy. Uh, thank you. Uh, I think that's a very important uh, input there. All right. Question number nine. Um, here's a question for you. The City of Ottawa should a embrace uh, urban experimentation like the November 2016 bylaw that. Uh, was enacted to permit coach houses, or B, do more to preserve the existing character of neighborhoods. Quite a few people, as you guys know, um, uh, if the city of Ottawa does do more experimentation, uh, may may be very upset that the, the character of their neighborhoods uh, is, is changing. So we, we really have, you know, as part of this delegated democracy thing that we're, we're all participating in today, and again, thank you for that, uh, we're, we're trying to sort of say, do we, you know, do we preserve our neighborhoods without change? Is that is that the most important thing, or do we allow, allow more experimentation like the the, the, the 2016 bylaw? Bruce, uh, this is Simon speaking. Yeah, uh, I do think that uh, I think that we need more experimentation. I think that a lot of the the I think a lot of the status quo was built on a foundation that was, you know, about 20 or 30 years ago with suburban suburban neighborhoods that were built. And in my opinion, I think that they're very unsustainable the way that they are built with their lack of mixed use and the way that it is separated. You're going to need to provide other options uh, for the people. I mean, you're going to need to provide some level of, just like you did for the coach houses, uh, you know, for, for rural and agricultural yeah. properties, you're going to, you're going to need to do that um, and, and, and try and find ways to, um, to really create the, you know, the, the people's own sense of infill and intensification and mixed use, quite frankly, and create more rules that's going to allow that to take people, take that into their own hands um, and their own, do their own dime to do it, right? I mean, if you, if you create rules and regulations that allow people to experiment with things like that, um, and I don't say not entirely unregulated, but, you know, just to, to give people a little bit of freedom to actually have their own, uh, you know, uh, their own business. Yeah, well, so the, the, the city of Ottawa has discussed internally, um, you know, permitting micro retail so that uh, if you're, uh, you or your wife, uh, Stephanie, wanted to, uh, you know, have a little, uh, uh, you know, patisserie or a little bakery in your, in your garage and, and your neighbors want to walk over for fresh uh, croissant uh, every morning, that you should be permitted to do that. Uh, right. But other people, I can tell you, are not so keen on that. Uh, so, you know, the, the, the idea of delegated democracy is to try and come to some kind of consensus on what is and is not acceptable. Yeah, no, that's understood. I just think that they, they, you know, the status quo, I don't think is working. And that's what I'm saying is I think that there has to be a level of, um, of, of, of options that are available to people to do things like that. So that would be my only point. Thank you, Simon. Yep. So Bruce, it's Christian still following on that. So the, I was going to mention this earlier when we were talking about the mixed use piece, but the reality is what people fear is that one uh, use will start to dominate over their traditional use. And so they're worried about things overrunning, such as student housing overrun or their housing getting converted to completely commercial zoning. Um, so in reality, while, you know, I think the consensus on the call is that we want mixed use, I think in reality, what we need to do is put certain uh, guide or guardrails along the way just to make sure that we do it in a manageable fashion. Yeah, I like that. I'm going to use that term. I'm, I'm just taking notes as you guys talk, so I, I love the idea. Uh, so, so we need uh, uh, 
guardrails. That that's a new term uh, to me, Christian. But I'm I'm, I'm going to steal it. Uh, anyone else would like to uh, uh, chime in here on question nine? I really like that. This is Rebecca again. I really like that that uh, terminology and the thinking as well. I mean, within a within a block in a traditional neighborhood, um, it may make sense to have one, you know, four to six story apartment building, but, uh, you know, more than that really begins to, to change the neighborhood and to turn people against intensification. But I think part of the messaging that really has to get out is that if, if the residents of the city of Ottawa really don't like the 65 story towers, um, then they are going to have to get friendlier with intensification at, at lower levels in order to accommodate the huge number of new units that we need, which is by some estimates 20,000 new units over the next 10 years. That's, that's a, a really significant uh, number of new houses to, to bring onto the market, and, and we have to figure it out. So, Thank you. All right. This is Paul. Yeah, uh, Paul. Uh, and, and by the way, everybody, we we have, we have somewhere between 19 and 21 participants here, and we're hearing from me, and we're hearing from some other people. But listen, guys, don't be shy about ch chiming in. So, Paul, go ahead. Um, we might even I, I like the concept of guardrails. That the, that uh, the the flexibility for experimentation in some neighborhoods may be a lot wider than in other neighborhoods. Uh, like in Canada North, you don't have any, re in, around the tech park, you don't have any residents near it. So you can have a lot more experimentation than, say, New Edinburgh. Yeah, I hear you. All right, so question 10. Uh, um, uh, the City of Ottawa should, A, assist projects and developments the city believes uh, create a net benefit, or B, not do that because it creates a bad precedent. And I'm just going to give you a little background on this question. Uh, when I used to work with the city of Nepean a long time ago now, Bill Leatham was the head of uh, the planning department, maybe uh, the commissioner, I guess. And uh, it, whether it was a small project or a medium size or a huge project, if he thought it would create a net benefit for the city of uh, Nepean, he would bring in his planning people and his transportation and his infrastructure people and tell them, look, let's, let's uh, assist this project. Other people argue that creates a bad precedent. How do you feel about the city um, uh, creating a, a, a position where people are actually facilitating uh, projects that are considered of net benefit? Uh, Bruce? Yeah. This is uh, Simon speaking. So I, I think this all comes down to, again, it's the status quo versus change. And I think that, um, I think that encouraging a level of change that is a net benefit uh, you know, it might add a precedent to it, but um, I think that doing so is much better than just leaving it the way it is and having a status quo there. That's just a, a general a, opinion on the matter. Okay, anyone else? Hi, Bruce. Roddy Wallivar here. How are you doing? Hey, good to hear your voice, Roddy. I'm glad you chimed in. Thanks. Uh, thanks to you for doing this, and thanks for your support uh, for our business area. Uh, one of the things that uh, strikes me on this question, and I've mentioned it to city staff in the past, is uh, right now federal, provincial, and then city governments are uh, very aggressively for the past couple of years, what they call investing in infrastructure projects. And, and uh, a big part of the business case is that their money is well placed in doing that because of economic stimulus. So I'd, I'd just uh, you know ask you to to take that example and, and map it over to this example in that uh, you know, our municipal government and federal and provincial are ready and willing to invest money when an economic benefit is asserted. In this case, often jobs, but also other things like transportation efficiency. And so I'd, I'd say yes to, uh, to your question here. Uh, the obvious tricky one is the, the, the proverbial government can't pick winners but uh, they're already kind of doing that and deciding which projects the uh, federal provincial gas tax money goes from an infrastructure perspective. I'd say the same logic could be brought to other community building and economic projects. Thank you, Roddy. Anybody else would like to chime in on question 10? All right, we're gonna uh, move on to question 11. Um, 
Okay, <laughs> the city of Ottawa should A, ensure that roadways give priority to efficient movement of cars, trucks, and buses, or B, look to develop a more wunerf, that's a Dutch term meaning living roads, where pedestrians are prioritized over cars. And I think, or over vehicles, I think I had a couple of uh, pictures here, yeah, uh, which you can see. So the Dutch are very strong believers in in Wunner, uh living roadways where, where cars are permitted, but they're considered guests and pedestrians and cyclists are, are given priority. Um, many people think that you can't do Wunner roads in Canada because we have a terrible winter. So I put a picture here uh, of Quebec City. The old city of Quebec is uh, one of the treasures, I think, of, of Quebec in Canada. And uh, uh, they certainly know how to deal with snow, even though their roadways uh, in the old city are tiny. So, so what what is the feeling? Should should we be prioritizing, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, cars uh, over pedestrians or pedestrians over cars, even if it means that car transit traffic times uh, for vehicles and buses will will be much longer? So, Bruce, it's Christian. Uh, I'll just sort of kick it off very quickly. I guess the, the issue the issue is that you can't have the the Wunerf concept without an effective transportation model, uh, and specifically forms of public transportation that can easily move people in and out of uh, these particular areas. So, even though we have the concept of of mixed use. That's something that's going to take decades to fundamentally evolve. So if we want to move towards a, a winner type type solution, you know, if we fundamentally exclude suburbanites from being able to participate, say, in a core function where we'd start to put these types of concepts, or even if we do it within the suburban communities, but we don't have an effective way of bringing people into those areas, they, they're going to have a tough time surviving. Okay, um, uh, people are ringing my doorbell, so I've been muting myself. Uh, had, would anybody else like yeah. to chime in on this, please? Yeah, Bruce, it's uh, Andrea Steenbakers again. Can you hear me, Bruce? Loud and clear. Okay, great. I'm just I'm in my car now, so I wasn't sure how the transition was going to go. Um, I agree with Christian. Um, I believe it was. Uh, I think in theory, I I love the idea of it. Um, however, practically, um, we don't have, and we're nowhere near having the type of robust and efficient transit system that would allow the majority of people living outside of the core to live and have any kind of quality of life without, um, unfortunately, you know, giving, continuing to give priority to roads. Um, I, I do think over time we should be moving toward that, but in the meantime, we still have to provide you know, better roads and, and, and uh, transit to, for, for the existing conditions. Um, you know, it takes, uh, it takes an hour and 20 minutes to get from Barhaven to Kanata North Business Park to go to work using, using transit. Um, so to, to suggest that that would be uh, made longer in any way, I think is it just, you know, it's, just, it's not realistic. Um, you know, and, and we're not even we're not even on the plan for getting LRT uh, anytime soon. Not, definitely not in stage two. So I just don't I just don't know how it would work for for people sort of in this end and probably in the west end of the city as well. Uh, uh, your, <clears throat> excuse me, your point's well taken, Andrea. All right, uh, uh, just uh, I apologize to interrupt sure. on that one. Are you going to talk about public transportation in as part of your questions later? You know what? I can't remember all the questions. <laughs> well, uh, I just, I'll leave you with a, a little tidbit uh, okay. 10 seconds here. So the other thing we have to consider is that nature of public transportation is going to change over the next 25 years. Uh, with autonomous vehicles coming into the, uh, into the circuit of stuff, right now the prediction is that fully autonomous vehicles will be around 2045. We'll have about 30 million uh, cars within North America that are fully autonomous. There's a whole progression around that I won't get into. But there's a lot of move towards last mile transportation with autonomous vehicles into public hubs. So this will change the dynamic in terms of how people start to move. And, it, and we do need to anticipate how our communities need to evolve in the reality that fundamental public transportation will change from what it traditionally looks like. Thank you, Christian. Uh, question number 12 is, I think, very uh, topical. 
Um, should the city of Ottawa declare a state of climate emergency and pursue active measures to address climate change and green issues, or it's not part of the city's mandate. And I don't have to tell anybody who lives in Ottawa what uh, we're experiencing right now with the Shawty Air Bridge being closed uh, due to uh, uh, severe uh, flooding and high water levels. Um, but on the other hand, I did want to point out, so I just want to balance here before we have the discussion, uh, that, that the, the governments have done uh, uh, stuff in the environmental area. I don't know if any of you guys remember the, the one ton challenge. I, I think it was Rick Mercer acting on behalf of what was then a conservative government. And I'm not a political guy, so this is not a political statement. But I actually checked out the one ton challenge. And the only suggestion that they had was uh, when you or your kids are brushing your teeth, turn off the hot water you'll save some energy that way. It was pretty limited. So going back to the question, you know, it realistically, is this something that the city should be acting on? And if so, uh, what should we be doing? Bruce, it's Paul. I think they need to be, I think we're focused, if we focus on, on uh, transportation, uh, intensification, having more diverse neighborhoods, I think that's going to, in the long run, meet a lot of uh, environmental uh, checkboxes. But if we start talking about an emergency, we're going to start making rational, very short-term choices and maybe even emotional choices. Thank you. Uh, anybody else want to chime in on that? Um, it's Andrea Steenbakers again. Um, I, I agree uh, with Paul, I believe it was. Um, I think, you know, more long-term planning and changes like better transit and even decentralization of government. Uh, I know that's not a, a, a municipal mandate, but decentralization of government, also um, more mixed, true mixed-use neighborhoods so that we're taking people off of the roads because they can actually work uh, closer to where they live, which would then lend to pedestrian and biking and that sort of thing because it would be a little bit more realistic not everybody has you know an hour and a half to get to work um, that's the three hours a day you know out of their time so I do think that those th those policies in the long term will affect um, the, the environment in a positive way thank you uh, question number 13 uh, the city of Ottawa is in a worldwide competition for talent I hear this from Shopify I hear this from uh, you know a, a dozen uh, dozens of, of tech companies and non-tech companies we're in a worldwide competition for talent uh, what can the city do to attract retain uh, such people so Bruce Christian Spilfo I'll just chime in quick on this one so the, the this kind of is comes back to multinationals too, and what you would uh, you know do to recruit them or bring them in as well. Ottawa has a lot going for it. A lot of people recognize the value of Ottawa, the balanced lifestyle, the use you know nature, um, the fantastic festivals uh, that we have in the city, and how much the city has overall grown. I think it's slowly that reputation is finally starting to leak out. But we've got two issues, and I know the city is aware of it, but there are two fundamental issues um, with Ottawa. One is being able to grow fast enough to be able to bring people in. And by growth, I mean, you know, housing for the most part, maybe some office space, but definitely housing. And C CBRE has already identified that as, a, as a, an issue that they foresee. The other, which is really much more fundamental and a really hard one to, to deal with, is uh, transportation in and out of the city. Um, we are very limited, right? We have a little bit of rail. We have an airport that is a secondary hub on the uh, national and international scale. Um, and that really is a major detractor from even international firms from coming in. Question about it. Uh, anybody else would like to chime in on this? Because we've got uh, 10 minutes left. Bruce, it's Paul Devi again. Um, I'd like to, uh, my pet project, Canada North, uh, we need to realize that the city has two large uh, commercial office areas. One is downtown, the second one is Canada North. In fact, it has more workers there than all of Gatineau does in terms of offices. And, but when you're talking to, uh, to city leaders, there's no understanding of that. And uh, 
I have examples where uh, uh, people have, companies have said, no, we're not locating in Canada. We're not locating in Ottawa at all because it takes uh, 40 minutes to get from the Queensway up March Road into the park. I, I understand. I think a lot of people uh, feel that the LRT should should go to Canada North. It, it should definitely go to the airport. It should go to Barhaven. Uh, I, I mean, you cannot have a modern city without light rail. I lived in Sydney, Australia for many years, and and I taught in Stockholm. You'd never think of of taking a car across Stockholm. You'd just go on their, their subway, which is incredible. Uh, question 14. The city of Ottawa already has a high school for the arts, the Canterbury high school for the arts uh, should it also have um, a high school for the technological arts uh, for the trades for entrepreneurship or, or any other so it's Christmas pill for I'll, I'll just give a big fat yes to this right <laughs> for on the entrepreneurship side uh, we have an education system right now that trains people to be good employees uh, and you know, effectively give up their dreams. Um, and we don't really teach entrepreneurship until very late stages, if you're lucky in university, but often it's not until you leave university and get into an incubator. Um, I, I personally think that it would be huge for society, not just Ottawa, for us to be bringing things like entrepreneurship and an understanding of entrepreneurship and encouraging it right in the earlier parts of our school system. Uh, I, I hear you. Uh, question 15, I'm trying to get through as many as we can. We've got eight minutes left. Uh, how can the city of Ottawa have closer integration uh, with other municipalities and townships in eastern Ontario, West Quebec, not to mention Montreal and Toronto? And I did put uh, together some, some numbers. Uh, many people feel that, uh, uh, urbanists and economists feel that, that the future is only going to be focused uh, on cities that are 10 million and up. And we don't have a single one of those in Canada. But uh, I think it was Alain Miguelis who pointed out that if you look at Toronto, Montreal, Ottawa, Gatineau, which is kind of a region in itself, there's about 12 million people in there. But how do we bring them closer together? Anybody want to chime in on that? That's a tough one. Yeah, it's it's a tough one, Bruce. Uh, you know, and I just think it's kind of catching us on the hop. But um, you know, there is a level of regionality. Like if we take a look at Ottawa, Gatineau, and more specifically the Outaouais in eastern Ontario, you know, if you take a look at things like Smith's Falls, Carleton Place, Arn Prior. Um, you know, these are effectively, you know, on, on the spokes of the city anyway, and are fundamentally integrated in terms of what's going on with the city. So I think you're right to raise the question in terms of how we certainly in, involve that. Um, I don't have a specific answer, but I, I think it's a valid question. Okay, I'm going to skip Bruce. over. Yes, yeah, so who is it? Hi, Bruce, it's Bob here. Can you hear me all right? Yeah, thank I you, I think the, the one thing that it, when you're looking at transportation to bring the people closer together, it's the distances between, say, Ottawa and Toronto. There's been a lot of talk about high-speed rail and whether that should be done or not. But I think that is the key thing, is to bring in high-speed rail. It's a That's lot of problems with air transportation. But if we can bring in high-speed rail so that we're like an hour or hour and a half from Toronto, then I think you'll see a lot more connections and movement and uh, I think the city would probably prosper. Yeah, I, I think that's a very strong point, and thank you for that. Um, um, we've now got five minutes left, so I'm gonna skip over this one. Um, I'm gonna skip over that one too. I gotta see if I can get to, let's see, let's see if I can get to the next one here. Sorry guys, I've got one uh, last question. No. I just wanted to get to one more, which is number 21. Here it is. <laughs> if you were king or queen of the city of Ottawa for a day, what would you do? And some of the other people who haven't spoken, come on, you guys, the men and women, uh, you know, if you were queen or king of the city of Ottawa for a day, what changes would you make? I go. 
guess I stumped you guys. Um, so some of my, uh, if I was king or queen, I, I was Ruth, just trying to be quiet to give other people a chance to talk. Hang on a second, since I, I, I've got the floor now, I would make garage offices legal. I would make second driveways legal. Um, uh, you know, I would do something uh, with a national boardwalk. I have this idea that we need a national boardwalk to go along with our uh, longest skating rink in the world. So uh, if I were king or queen of Ottawa for day, I have a few ideas. So Christian, uh, we've got now four minutes left. Why don't you chip in here? No, no, I was actually going to be completely quiet, right? So <laughs> I don't think that's today. possible for you. <laughs> I'm going to try. So I'm actually going to be quiet and let other people talk. No, that's okay. we got uh, three minutes left. Come on, if you're king or queen of Ottawa for a day, what would you do to, to, to improve the, uh, the, 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 the city? Hi, Bruce, it's Eva. Hi, Eva. Hi. Um, my biggest thing is make Airbnb fully legal. It does provide affordable housing yeah. because I have students that are, that are using my Airbnb. Um, and the time is very flexible, which is what they need. And, um, oh, that's cool. Yeah, that I have a whole different angle on that. And um, if people, if the city's allowing secondary suites, definitely allow expanded parking. Right. Um, in my neighborhood, which is the Alta Vista area, um, built in the 60s when people, women stayed at home. Yeah. And, and they only had one car. Nowadays, most families need two cars. Okay. Um, all right. That's good. Anyone else? Andrea, you must have a pet a, a pet idea that if, if you were queen of uh, Ottawa for a day. Gee, um, I would honestly, I think we should um, take advantage of the fact that we have three rivers really um, wow. in, in the area. Wow. And, and really utilize our waterfront, um, obviously in a responsible way, but take advantage uh, more, you know, more economic development uh, opportunities with regard to the water. I, I really like that. And I want to, I'll tell a funny story and I've got two minutes to do it. And, and then we're, we're going to all sign off. And, and yeah. by the way, uh, if you guys, if you guys have time after this is over, can each of you just send an email to bruce.firestone at century21.ca and just put in the subject line YouTube so that I'll make sure I get everybody's email address and I'll send you this, uh, the YouTube link so you can, you can share it with your friends or just look at it again. So just send me uh, an email, bruce.firestone at century21.ca, then YouTube and I'll send you the link because I'm going to upload it. So the story, Andrew, that I was going to tell is when I was a little boy, I went to Rockcliffe Park Public School and I went to the park every weekend with my buddies to play football or soccer or baseball. And, um, uh, and when I came back from Australia, I took my oldest son, Andrew, to the park. And when I was a kid, there used to be, you know, a thousand people there in the park. I'm not kidding, on the weekend. And when I yeah. went back, there wasn't a single person there. And you know why? It's because the NCC closed the bathrooms right. there and closed Oh, the no. Yes, and they closed the well, store. There was a little store where you could get hot dogs. Yeah. And, and once they but closed can... that... Once they close that, nobody went to the park anymore. So if you want to open up our parks and our rivers, you do have to consider well, some active uses. I can, I, and I can tell you that every time I travel, no matter where I'm going, whether it's you know a city, a town, uh, any a beach area, I'm always seeking out um, entertainment along the waterfront. Every time I travel, it's just, yeah. If you I go to Austin, if you go to Austin and and, and or oh, it's Austin, Texas. You know what I'm talking about. Okay, yeah. it's one thirty. I did promise everybody uh, to to thank you again, and I really, really appreciate the input. It was fantastic. And 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 by the way, when you send me that email, uh, if you want, if you had another idea and you were maybe a little bit shy about saying it uh, out loud on this call, you're you're more than welcome to put it in an email to me, and I will include it in the report. One thirty one. See you guys. Bye. Thanks Thank you. Great conversation. Thanks, Great everybody. Job. Really good job. Thanks, guys. It was fun, Bruce. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye.